1972, on the heels of the blockbuster movie Shaft, comes the definitive black exploitation flick about a cocaine dealer who's trying to make one last big score so he can get out of the game. Superfly was a phenomenon when it opened in August of that year. It was as popular as it was controversial, and it will forever be known for the incredible soundtrack composed and performed by soul music legend Curtis Mayfield. This music arguably brought the film most of its success. Driving rhythm guitar, hand percussion, orchestration, socially conscious falsetto lyrics by Curtis Mayfield. It's incredible. So why am I talking about it on this channel? For the money, the Superfly soundtrack is one of the greatest albums of bass lines and bass playing you'll ever hear. Joseph Lucky Scott, then only 23 years old, plays some of the funkiest, most melodic and memorable bass you'll ever hear on Wax. In fact, most of the song's hooks come from the bass, which is mixed right in front of everything else. Lucky Scott was a carryover from the backup band of The Impressions, the vocal group that Curtis Mayfield had left two years prior to go solo. Impressions co-founder Sam Gooden was Lucky's uncle and brought him in as bass player. All of those things, every one of those songs, he could not read a lick. He had the greatest ear around as far as a musician is concerned. He was that talented. He could just pick up all the things and also add a little bit of himself within the song. That's what he did as Curtis grew. And then when Curtis did the Superfly thing, then he had a bass pattern that he had created himself and he became famous for it. This iconic record is as much Lucky Scott as it is Curtis Mayfield. So to recreate this vibe and this sound, I took my Fender Jazz and I strung her up with some flat wounds. I also ran into my Sans Amp DI to give me a little bit of crunch when I was playing. Let's get into the music. Track one, right away, we hear a huge sound. Huge fundamental. I like that there's a little bit of fret noise. The high end coming off the jazz bass with those flats sounds beautiful. I also like that the sound is a little dirty, which says to me that he wasn't going direct. They might have been miking him from an amp, which by all accounts was probably a Fender bass man from what I've read. Now right away what you're going to hear is a trademark of some of the music from that time through the 60s coming into the early 70s. The best way to fatten up a line was to double it. And the bass line here is being doubled by the guitar, especially this line. It's a really cool effect and it makes the music a little bigger in that place. I love it. of note is the little tweak that he makes to the bass line from the instrumental section to the vocal sections. He takes that fifth note and he plays it short, very subtle, but if you catch it, it sounds like this. Very cool little thing happening in the music and it gives it lift. Now, if you haven't seen the movie, Pusher Man is one of the coolest parts. What they do in the film is they show a series of photos while playing the song itself. It's very cool and not something you see very often in film. Now this song, we hear the power of a bass line only. At the top of the song, there are no chords. You are hearing just the bass line and it carries the groove. It is the hook of the song.
Harmonically, the song is pretty cool. When you take that bass line and you put two triads on top of it, you get the sound of the tune. Those two triads being a D minor triad and a C minor triad. Listen again with the chords put in over the bass line. Now space is very important. Short notes really count on this record. Short first note followed by a long accented second note. That's how you get the vibe. Now the bridge of this song is one of my favorite parts and this is a color he uses throughout the record. He goes to the minor four chord. Remember that because that comes up over and over again, the minor four chord. Another theme is a really heavy, steady groove in the A section in a complete change in character when it comes to the bridge, bass playing wise. Listen to how adventurous Lucky gets in the bridge. He goes up to the ninth of the chord. So if our chord is B flat minor seven, he plays a C, which is an awesome jazzy sound. And he does that time and time again on the record, if you notice it, I love it. Now this one is the hot track on the record. This lick is just dripping with This is another line where you don't need any chords to know what the bass line is saying. The bass line on Freddy's Dead is the hook of the song. And we come back to that theme of doubling it for more power. On this track, you're gonna hear the bass line doubled by guitar, by flute, even Barry sax at some point. Now the most important thing about this track is that it's swung 16th notes. The 16th notes are swung like you would swing eighth notes in jazz. So rather than a 1E and a 2E and a 3E and a 4E and a... The swing lays back the 16th notes like this. 1E and a 2E and a 3E and a 4E and a... verse, one of my favorite parts, guess where he goes to? The ninth. The ninth. It's F sharp minor, it goes up to a G sharp. Again, that jazzy sound is perfect for this vibe. We've also firmly established the really solid repetitive kind of playing that happens in the A section with a super loose floating legato kind of B section. It's a really great concept that's used throughout the album. Probably the coolest part of the song and the most recognizable part of the song uh, happens just after the key change. If you've seen the trailer, you've probably heard this part, but it goes up a half step to D minor. Then it comes back down to C sharp minor. Uh, at this point, the strings all play one note. This is called a unison. And right here, Lucky Scott takes a little variation with triplets that sounds like this. Man, funky. Again, Curtis Mayfield is making use of this chord movement where we go to the four in the next section, the minor four chord. It's a common theme on this album, but I think it works perfectly. It creates a vibe, it creates a color, it creates a sound that links all these songs together. 
Now this next one is just a little ditty that's a musical interlude to get you through the kind of chasing through the streets that happens in Superfly. Personally, I love it. Um, it gives us exactly what we need musically. It's grooving, again, like crazy. And for the first time really on the soundtrack, we hear the piano. We hear this sweeping kind of broad piano, which to me always sounded like the big city. It always sounded like New York. When you introduce this kind of big grand piano playing over these grooves, it gave it an urban feel that you can't capture with other instruments, in my opinion. Now this isn't too hard of a groove, but take a look at that rhythm. That 16th, 8th, 16th rhythm is a rhythm I think everybody should know. You should know how it looks, you should know how it sounds, and you should be aware that we've already seen that rhythm when it comes to Freddy's Dead. That's a very common syncopated rhythm you should definitely add to your vocabulary because it's one that you're going to see a lot moving forward. This is an incredible groove. Uh, the first time I heard it, I thought it was tribal sounding. When I programmed my click, instead of just giving myself a click, I thought it was much more appropriate to approximate the drums, those 16th notes with the bass drum, because that's essential to the groove. Very tribal sounding. Short notes are very critical in this. The bass is almost playing like a percussion instrument. There's a definite swag to the way that this groove walks down the street. Again, the piano being introduced in this track makes me think of skyscrapers. And if you noticed, section goes to the minor four chord. I don't think he's running out of ideas. I think this is just a common thread that he's using to give the record a sound. Very cool. I love this tune. This is kind of the, the song to the sidekick who eventually betrays him uh, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, it's a great tune, great lyrics again, Curtis Mayfield. But if you notice the way the chords move in the verse, one to minor four, the sound of the record, the sound of, of urban New York in the early 70s. You should also know that we're hearing a chord that we haven't heard yet. In the fourth bar, the chord C sharp, sharp nine, flat 13. There's a flat 13 in there as well. This is a new chord, new sound. This altered dominant sound. This is a very jazz heavy sound, but one of my favorite chords. Pay attention to it. This is one of the busier tracks on the album. So the bass is playing a lot more conventional 
and in the pocket. The way he's playing here reminds me a lot of James Jamerson in the way that Jamerson might lay something down with amazing fills happening every two or four bars. To me, this album represents the beginning of the post-Jamerson bassist going into the 70s and beyond. We hear Jamerson's influence for sure, but we also hear something new that's going to take over in the next year or two and propel us into the 70s when it comes to bass playing moving forward. And I can't reiterate this enough. This track is a great listen just to check out the power of space. I've met many people over the years, and in my opinion, I have. When I listened to this track, the first thing I thought of, very first thing that came in my head, was Barry White. This is a very common soul music convention from around that time, but I'm sure you've heard it in other music. It's very popular in soul music. Someone is actually speaking to kind of set up the whole uh, subject matter for us to hear right away. Isaac Hayes did it a bunch. Barry White was a big uh, spoken word guy. Curtis Mayfield here. We're hearing that vibe. And when you hear that sweeping piano, that's what made me think of Barry White. And this predates when Barry did it, so, hmm. Lyrically speaking, this is where the brilliance of the album lies. The movie was very controversial. It still is. It's about drug dealers. Uh, there's drug use. There's murder. Uh, there's a lot of seedy elements in the movie. And Curtis Mayfield took the soundtrack and he made it staunchly anti-drug, including this track. He put in overt messages about how we need to stay away from the game. That's something I love about this record and probably one of the reasons why it's so enduring. It teaches us a lesson versus the amazing and violent movie that Superfly is. Again, for you young bass players, this is one of the densest tracks on the album. There's a lot going on here between the rhythm section and horns and strings and solos. So what does Lucky Scott do? He plays it right down the middle, simple and solid. There's a bonus track on the 25th anniversary of this album where Curtis Mayfield talks about this song specifically and saying that he was very proud of it and how he wrote from his heart and from his true to life experience. I think we can hear that in this track. This track is in 9-8. 9-8, don't let that scare you. Really, we're dealing with a pulse of three beats. This song is in three. One, two, three. Usually when we play in three, we divide by two, like we do in four. Everything is divided by two. One and two and three and one and two and three. Only in the case of this track 
We're gonna put three eighth notes for every beat. One, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three. That's where the nine comes from. Nine divisions of eighth notes. Nine, eight. We only think of it in three. That's what the sound of this track is. track in the key of funk the key that we all love to play key of E now I will not lie to you this was the hardest one uh, I had to take about five or six passes at this to get it really clean and sounding good it is very syncopated when you first look at it but it is a lot of fun to play again no chords when we hear Lucky Thompson playing this on the soundtrack and the opening is just bass and hand percussion. That's all it needs. The bass line is the hook of this song. Lucky is also really going in on this track, as we say. His most adventurous playing is happening during the song Superfly, in my opinion. Now this very syncopated line is only occurring with E, B, and D. That's it. Those are the only notes that are involved. There's a few octaves, but if we take it slowly, one, two, three, four. That's it. That's the funk, but it is a very well-written line and an excellently played line. Especially check out what he's doing in the B sections. Not only is the chord movement really interesting going from C major 7 to A minor, but the way Lucky is negotiating all of those chords with the syncopations he's playing is quite remarkable. Here's my version of it. Superfly was only the beginning for Joseph Lucky Scott. He became the house bassist for Curtis Mayfield's record label, Curtum Records. And he ended up cutting tracks with the likes of Natalie Cole, Aretha Franklin, and he even ended up on a number one track with the Staple Singers on the song Let's Do It Again from the film of the same name in 1975. He would eventually leave secular music for his true passion, gospel. In the church, he would play bass, keyboards, even drums. He died of a heart condition suddenly in 1996 at the age of only 47. I think you'll agree with me that he left more than enough groove behind for the rest of us. I personally have taught these iconic bass lines to my students for years now, and for good reason. They show you how a really strong bass line can anchor an entire song and be the hook of it. It also shows you how a few well-placed notes and rhythms can be indelible, funky, and lay the groundwork for a great song and a great record. So if you don't have Superfly, baby, go and get it. It's the truth. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, I'd very much appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up. And if you want all original jazz, Base centric content coming at you every single week. Click that subscribe button so that you can stay updated the next time I post a video just like this one. Until next time, stay safe and please love your neighbor. Peace. But if you lose, don't ask no questions why. The only you know is do or die.